So systematic treatment of equilibria is really just a process of generating as many equations as you possibly can such that you have at least the same number of equations as you do unknowns. And unknowns in this case are just concentrations of species in that chemical system. Um, there's no, you know, absolute method by which you're generating those equations. So I just have a recommended set of steps um, that I use. It comes out of your book. So usually just write up all the relevant chemical reactions that you know, that you can think of given the stuff that might be in solution. You write up a charge balance, there's only one of those. You write up a mass balance, at least one, if not more. Uh, then you write up the equilibrium constant expressions for each of the chemical reactions that you drafted in step one. Uh, and then hopefully at that point you have um, enough equations to solve the unknowns either through substitution or matrix algebra. The example we'll run through with this is just a dilute solution of ammonia in water. So we know that as ammonia dissolved in water, uh, water acts as an acid. Uh, protonates the weak base, which is ammonia, NH3, and generates NH4. And so anytime you have ammonia, NH3 dissolved in solution, what you really have is an aqueous solution of ammonium hydroxide. But to what extent? We don't know. Um, so we need to consider this via systematic treatment of equilibria because we also need to consider what are the effects of um, the protons that are being generated and the hydroxide ions being generated simply from the auto dissociation of water and how are those, at least in magnitude, related to those being generated from the ammonia, weak acid, weak base solution. So we have to take into account both of those systems. So of course this is a pretty simple system um, and, and you'll see even with a simple system the, the substitution algebra gets complicated. So um, we'll do this simply uh, but rest assured I will not ask you to spend an enormous amount of time doing systematic treatment by hand because it's really not worth your time. Um, I'll probably, on quizzes or exams, ask you to generate a charge balance or a mass balance for certain things, but I'm never going to have to. I'm never going to have you spend more than uh, you know 10 minutes or so doing any substitutional algebra to solve something like this um, because there are faster methods uh, like a, a software package that you'll learn um, if you haven't already started. To, to learn that in this class so far. So writing up the pertinent reactions, we know the first one, which I already mentioned to you, is ammonia is a weak base, so it's of course going to react with protic water to grab one of those protons. Um, and we can look up the, the uh, Kb for this, which is uh, 1.76 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, and then the other reaction in this simple system is just water itself, right? And so uh, water is going to um, auto-dissociate uh, or autoprotonate itself and it's going to make uh, hydroxide ions and uh, H plus ions and we know at least at 25 degrees C if we don't consider activity that uh, at least at this point that's going to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. So that's step one. Uh, we're, again we're keeping this simple and oftentimes you'll you'll learn that uh, the the accuracy of your model, your equilibrium model, is only as good as the inputs that you put into it. And so if this, this is all you know, if these are the only reactions that you know, then your model might deviate somewhat if there's in fact other things present in solution. So the more you know about your solution, about what's there, the more potential reactions you can generate with equilibria and then factor those into your overall model. And that'll get you closer to truth. Uh, you're probably never going to get full truth, even with software models, because there's stuff that you just don't know is going to exist in your solution and at what concentrations those things exist at. But again, like the whole progression from a general chemistry course to an analytical chemistry course is thinking intuitively, adding more complexity to the models, uh, knowing that the more complexity you add, the closer you get to the true or accurate value there of the system. Okay, so let's toss up a, a quick charge balance here. There's not that much that's charged in this system. Uh, we've got ammonium, uh, high, uh, the H plus, and the OH minus. So, and all those are positive one or negative one, so that makes it pretty easy. We can say that the ammonium ion, NH4 plus, plus the uh, proton, H plus, has to be equal to the hydroxide ion concentration. That has to be true um, based on the electroneutrality clause. Okay, mass balance here. Um, this is going to be the sort of first type of mass balance that I mentioned as an example where we're given some quantity of something uh, and then we can relate that quantity to sort of the, the formal concentration of, of that thing. So we know that we tossed in 0.01 moles of ammonia in one liter of water and we know that that ammonia uh, is only going to exist in two forms, either as NH3 or NH4. And so what we can say from a mass balance perspective is that the um, NH4 
three concentration, that original concentration, uh, some of that is going to react with water to make NH4. So those two things together still have to equal whatever the original formal concentration was, which would be 0 0.10 moles uh, per 1.000 liters, which is the same as um, 0 0.010 molar. Uh, so this expression, uh, ammonia plus ammonium equals 0 0.010 molar, would be the mass balance in this case. And I'll, and I'll just uh, reiterate here, often we call this concentration here, uh, you'll see in your textbook, we call this the formal concentration and anytime we use the term formal concentration, what that means is the concentration before we've allowed any compensation for equilibrium reactions. So if we throw in 0.01 mole uh, uh, ammonia, we can say that the original formal concentration of ammonia in solution was 0.01 molar, even though we know some of that's going to react. Uh, and so you'll, your textbook will sometimes shortcut this and just write it as a capital F. So you'll see as we move on to the next couple chapters, we'll use formal concentration, this nomenclature, pretty frequently. It's not imperative that you understand it totally right now. I just want to sort of uh, foreshadow its use in later chapters. Okay, so the fourth step here is just to take all of the reactions that we started with in number one, step one, uh, and, and draft those into actual equilibrium expressions, because those will be real equations that we can solve rather than the reactions, which aren't equations. So we write up KB, which has a numerical value. We've already looked that up, so I'm not going to write it down here, but that's what I mean by writing KB. That's a, that's a value. That's going to be equal to the concentration of the products over the reactants aside from the pure substances. Um, and if we're being really good, then we're, we're not talking about concentrations. We're, we're actually invoking activities, which I'll, which I'll do here, but um, we won't actually carry this through with activities um, in detail just because it's going to be um, pr pretty cumbersome. Um, but just know that that's, that would be the most accurate way to do it. So KB would actually be the activity of NH4 plus times the activity of OH minus divided by the activity of NH3. Uh, so that would be uh, the true way to write this for solution uh, today, just to keep things simple since we're doing this by hand. I'm just going to say that this is generically equal to the uh, concentration of uh, ammonium uh, times the concentration of hydroxide divided by the concentration of NH3, though we know that's not totally true if mu is anything but zero. But we'll, do, we'll, we'll just simplify things here. And then we'll also know that our other equilibrium expression here, Kw, is equal to um, the hydroxide ion concentration times H plus, technically we would be using activities here too. But So at this point, uh, step four is the only place where we actually would invoke activities um, in, in the reaction. Um, we would also, of course, use activities in the mass and charge balance, but um, this is the place where that would manifest. You'll see that the, the vast majority of this class in your textbook, we don't formally write out activities unless there's some specific thing that we want to illustrate. Otherwise, it becomes enormously cumbersome to have to compute uh, an activity coefficient for every single concentration. You spend all of your time doing activity coefficients and you sort of miss the point. So um, we aren't going to spend a ton of time with that, though it's still important that you understand what activity is and I'll still ask you several questions about activity and its impacts. Um, but as we get more complicated, we're, we're just not going to include that in our computations. But know that it should be if we're, if we're you know, trying to do this accurately as possible. Okay, so step five says count the equations and then the unknowns. Uh, if we go through here, you know, our, our unknowns here are uh, NH3, NH4, and OH, um, and technically H+, because we don't know one without the other. Um, so we've got really four unknowns, and we have um, a charge balance, a mass balance, and two equilibrium expressions. So we, we have four total equations, so four equations, four unknowns, that makes it solvable through just simple substitution or matrix algebra. So there's not really a method to the madness of uh, algebraic substitution. Um, don't spin your wheels too much here because it's, it's an enormous pain. Okay, so next I'm going to take the mass balance equation that's up here and I'm going to solve it for NH4 plus since that's what we have it solved for down here. Uh, so I'll have two things solved for NH4 plus and then I can set them equal to each other. 
So uh, if I take this mass balance equation, which just says that ammonia plus ammonium is equal to formal concentration, uh, that means I can say that NH4 plus concentration is really equal to the formal concentration minus uh, NH3. And remember, the formal concentration is just the original concentration before equilibrium. In this case, it's 0.01 molar. I'm just, I'm just writing F instead of 0.01 there. Uh, and so now I can, I can set these two things equal to each other um, because I have uh, in blue there, I have uh, NH4 in terms of H plus and KW, and now I have NH4 in terms of formal concentration and NH3. So these two things I can now substitutionally relate to each other because they're solved with respect to the same thing. So I could rewrite this and say that formal concentration minus ammonia is equal to KW over H plus minus H plus. So that's where we are right now. I can solve this whole thing for NH3. So essentially just moving NH, this negative NH3 to the right side and then moving this whole term to the left side or subtracting it. So we, we sort of just swapping places. So that'd be F for the formal concentration, which is really 0.01, remember, minus, uh, in this case, the, that whole term, KW over H plus. I haven't distributed the minus yet. Um, minus H plus. Uh, all in parentheses is equal to NH3, at least that's what my notes say. I think that should be good. Okay, cool. So the last step then is to take KB, which we haven't used yet. Remember, this is the KB value. And we have uh, NH4 uh, already solved in terms of H plus and, K and a constant. We have OH minus solved with respect to KW and uh, H plus and we have NH3 solved with respect to KW and H+. So in that case, that will allow us to get one expression in terms of a single variable and constants. So we'll be able to rewrite this and then solve for H+. So what that would look like, if you substituted all of those terms in, you would get something, some sort of behemoth of, a, of an algebraic expression. That would be KW over H+, minus H plus concentration, uh, that term, that term was the NH4 plus term, uh, and then the uh, OH term is going to be KW over H plus concentration, and then the uh, NH3 term, which we just solved for, would be this last thing, this F minus KW over H plus minus H plus. So this whole thing has to be equal to KB, which is a value, a constant that we can look up. So now we have everything in terms of H plus and constants, so we could rearrange this and solve this for H plus. So this equation is, um, it is painful, but solvable. Um, it's a cubic, fun cubic function. So um, this is what, uh, if we were to use a software program, this would be solved explicitly. And this will give you the right answer every time. So if you were to solve it this way, you would um, solve for H plus, that would give you the first unknown, then you would use that value and continue to iterate and plug it into um, some of our existing expressions here until you solve for all of the, the relevant unknowns here. Um, what I want to do here, because I don't think it's worth our time to go through and solve this cubic function uh, by hand, uh, what I would like you to do though is to, to develop and think and use our intuition to think about um, is it necessary to solve a cubic function? Uh, or can we simplify this um, based on some assumptions that we can apply to the system? So a general assumption we can make is that the concentration of the protons is uh, going to be less than, or significantly less than the concentration of hydroxide. And, and the reason we can make that assumption is because we're adding a base, uh, NH3, it's a weak base, to water. Uh, so when you add a base to water, right, the, the KW for that system is going to be H plus uh, uh, times OH minus. So NH3 uh, to water, NH3 plus H2O, as I, I could have just scrolled up, that's going to make NH4 plus plus hydroxide. So that's the actual base in the system. So the NH3 served as a base because it produced more hydroxide. Uh, hydroxide goes up, H plus goes down. Those two are sort of equal and opposite because they always have to satisfy the 10 to the minus 14 criterion for the auto dissociation water. Uh, 
So by saying that this is a base being added to water, then we know that these things, uh, protons and hydroxides, are not equal to each other anymore, and that, in fact, the hydroxide concentration is probably considerably higher. So if we start with that assumption, let's see what the implications are for that massive expression, that cubic expression, see if we can simplify things. So in the expression above, remember that it, you know, if we're at pH 14, meaning completely neutral solution, then, um, so let's just say, neutral conditions, meaning not basic, then the H plus concentration is going to be what? And well, it's going to be roughly 10 to the minus 7. So it's really small already. And hydroxide is going to be 10 to the minus 7. So in basic conditions, then hydroxide goes up, hydrogen ion goes down. So hydrogen ion concentration is going to be less than 10 to the minus 7 molar. So it's this really small number, considerably less. So even if this is slightly basic, then likely H plus is going to be more on the level of, say, 10 to the minus 9 or 10 to the minus 10, whereas the hydroxide ion concentration is going to be more on the, the range of like 10 to the minus 4. Just for, for your own sort of bearings, if you have a hydroxide ion concentration that's 10 to the minus 4, that's a, a pH of 10, which is really not that basic of a solution. That's a slightly basic solution, which would mean that your uh, hydrogen ion concentration is equivalent to 10 to the minus 10 to make these two things add up to 10 to the minus 14. So that's a really, really tiny number, right? So where, where does that have um, effect or implication in the original expression here, and, and does that change things? Well, if you look at this uh, hydrogen ion concentration here, if you're subtracting a really, really, really small number on the order of uh, anywhere from 10 to the minus 7 to, say, 10 to the minus 10, um, that becomes a negligible contribution to that mathematical operation. You're subtracting a tiny number, so the original number doesn't change. So one one implication here is that this becomes negligible. Then we say that it's essentially zero. Um, the same is true for this one, right? Because we're also subtracting a tiny number here, so we'll say that can be approximated to zero. Of course, we're going to check our approximations. But this is the first pass, right? We're saying that, well, even if it's weakly basic, then it has to be considerably less than 10 to the minus 7, which means you're, you're subtracting a value that's, uh, you know, like this uh, in terms of molarity. That's a tiny number being subtracted from potentially a larger number. And so that's our, our first um, criteria in, in that it potentially could simplify our... Okay, so that leads us to a simplified expression that looks like this, the one in blue. So I'm, I'm giving it sort of an approximate value. So we get rid of those two hydrogen ion concentrations. That simplifies things. Uh, at the same time, remember that um, Kw uh, is equal to um, proton concentration times hydroxide ion concentration. Uh, so Kw over H plus is equal to hydroxide ion concentration. So we have two of those right here. So we could um, sort of reframe this and say, uh, I'll just go down here, Kb then is going to be equal to hydroxide ion concentration squared over, uh, and again, this can be substituted here as well, um, over the formal concentration minus the hydroxide ion concentration. Okay, so what does that do for us? So since we know the formal concentration is 0.01 and we know Kb is, um, we can look that up, that's 10 to the minus 4.755, uh, which is the pKb of the system. Then what we have here, if we think of hydroxide ion concentration essentially as x, as, as any variable, what we have now is a simple quadratic. So to solve that, the first step would just be to multiply uh, this denominator uh, on both sides. Uh, and so we get this expression in red. So we essentially have the, um, the Kb multiplied now by the formal concentration, which we know is 0.01. I'm just leaving it as F so it's simpler. Uh, minus hydroxide ion concentration is equal to hydroxide ion concentration squared. So I'm going to be explicit here, and um, I'm going to substitute X for hydroxide just to make the make it look more presentable, but you don't need to. And then I'll, I'll pop 0.01 in for the formal concentration, which came from the original problem. That gives us this expression that I've written in blue, so it's looking closer and closer to, to just a simple quadratic. So I'll distribute that 10 to the minus 4.755, uh, and so what we get is the actual quadratic, so x squared plus 10 to the minus 4.755, x minus 10 to the minus 4.755 times 0.1, that's all equal to zero. So this is all solvable with a quadratic uh, equation.
so we could pop those uh, values in for um, a, b, and c into the quadratic expression, solve for x explicitly, x being a proxy for hydroxide ion concentration, and then once we have hydroxide ion concentration, we could resubstitute in and continue to solve for the rest of the variables. I'm not going to do that explicitly, but I'm giving you a sense for um, what what the levels of approximation are here, and, and um, we'll talk in, in, in sort of shortly what what are we comfortable with. Um, and again, the comfort level comes from sort of two different places, whether you approximate or you solve explicitly using um, the, the actual first cubic function that we talked about. And the, the two criteria for you, again, as always, one is what's the end use of the data? What's the end use of the number? How important is it to you? How important are all of the digits that you account for? So is accuracy really, really important? Um, but go, what goes hand in hand with that is how many significant digits can be conserved in your computation relative to the error that's going to be associated with approximation. So if you've got a reasonable sized error, uh, then it may behoove you to uh, solve things explicitly. But if the error is minimized, then it may not be, uh, it may not manifest uh, even for you to go through an approximation, you may not see it in your significant digits anyway. It, it could be that the difference between solving, solving it explicitly and through an approximation uh, may only change the fifth or sixth digit. Uh, and if you're only preserving three or four digits, um, then it's inconsequential. It won't manifest. Uh, so you, you aren't going to always know that. And sometimes it's just going to require you to do the math, uh, in which case having um, the computational models really makes things a lot easier because you're not spending a whole bunch of time going through the algebra trying to figure out w at what point do you take a shortcut. Okay, so uh, I want to present to you an even simpler approximation. Again, depending on the criteria required for the math that you're going to do here based on the significance of the error and the end use of the data. So remember, just the view from 10,000 feet here, uh, if you want to solve this number explicitly, you can solve the cubic function. If you want to get it pretty accurate uh, via a sim one sim simplification, then you'll solve the cubic or the quadratic function. Uh, the simplest approximation here uh, harkens back to what you learned in general chemistry. So let's think about this from an ice table perspective, the, the, the exact way that you would have solved this in a, in a Chem 108 class, right? In Chem 108, we would not have considered the auto dissociation of water as a, an extra equilibrium in the system. We would have just considered the weak base ammonia. We would have solved it using uh, an initial change and equilibrium table, an ice table like this, and that's it. That's what we would have done. So let's see what we would get using this approach, and let's see um, if that's worthwhile in this type of approximation. So the formal concentration of ammonia was the 0 0.01 moles added to the liter. That's what we started with. The water is a pure substance, so we don't need to consider that. In this case, we had zero ammonium present in the system. But uh, what about hydroxide? Well, if you're considering from sort of first principles, you've got this beaker of water, right? And in this example, we had 1.0 liters of water in this beaker. And before we added any of the ammonia, so just before we added that 0.01 moles of ammonia, there was just pure water there. Uh, what is the concentration of hydroxide in pure water? In general chemistry, you often would have just put zero here. But in reality, that's not zero, right? In pure, pure water, the concentration of hydroxide is going to be dictated again by just the simple auto dissociation of water. So hydroxide ion times uh, hydrogen ion, which is equal to 10 to the minus 14. So at equilibrium, that means hydroxide ion concentration would equal 10 to the minus 7. And so we could start this approximation by saying that there's actually 10 to the minus 7 molar hydroxide in the system to begin with. So as the, the, the NH3 is added to the system, the NH3 is going to grab a proton from water and it's going to convert some small fraction of itself to NH4. That's the equilibrium that we're dealing with here. So some amount X is going to, 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 to associate um, as a base. Water, we don't care about. Um, because the balanced chemical reaction here is one to one, then that means that um, we have one X being added for every one ammonia that's being added. For hydroxide then, that becomes uh, a plus X at equilibrium, we then have 0.10 minus x 
we have X concentration of ammonia or ammonium, and we have 10 to the minus 7 plus X as the, the additional concentration uh, of hydroxide. So what are the two approximations you made in a Chem 108 class? Well, one was you said, well, KB must be, KB is pretty small, right? It's a weak base. So if KB is small, which is, uh, you know, roughly almost 2 times 10 to the minus 5, which uh, if we think about that logically, that just means that the concentration of the reactants here, ammonia, is going to be about 10,000 times that of uh, the ammonium and the hydroxide at equilibrium. That's literally what that that ratio is telling us. Um, so that means the reaction is not going to proceed very far. It's going to proceed roughly one ten thousandth of the way that it could uh, to the right. So it's going to lie heavily towards the left, uh, which then um, could lead us to believe that X would be really small, right? Because only one ten thousandth of that is going to going to uh, actually dissolve. Um, the other approximation then that we make is that the 10 to the minus 7 is inconsequential, which is why we never included it in Chem 108. Uh, and sometimes that's true, uh, sometimes that's important, sometimes it's not. Uh, we'll check that here. So if that's the case, if both of these approximations are reasonable, then we could rewrite this expression as Kb uh, is equal to concentration of hydroxide times concentration of ammonium divided by the concentration of NH3 and uh, we're essentially saying that X is going to be negligible and this X is going to be negligible so all we're going to do is uh, change this to KB is equal to X over X over uh, the ammonia concentration which uh, is the same as the formal concentration meaning it didn't decrease by very much 0.010 uh, we can solve this. Now this becomes very easy to solve. So if we solve this, uh, this gives us x is equal to 4.2 times 10 to the minus 4 uh, molar. That's Think about where we started. So we started with including everything, and by everything I mean we only really included two equilibria, right? We included the original weak base equilibria, but we also included the auto dissociation of water, considering that maybe some amount of the hydroxide that gets generated here will also be generated from the dissociation of water. And we solved that explicitly and we got to a cubic function. We could have kept going, but it's not worth our time. Uh, that would have given us the exact answer. We then went to a simplification where we said, well, um, you know, maybe that uh, the hydrogen ion concentration is not going to be very large because uh, this is a weak base. And so cons considering hydroxide ion concentration is going to be quite a bit larger, probably at least two orders of magnitude larger for even really weak bases, which means that that got us to a quadratic equation. Uh, we didn't solve that, but we could have pretty easily. Um, and that would have given us a closer approximation. And now we, we, we dropped all the way down to the simplest approximation, which is, which is where you started probably your learning of, of equilibria, where we just didn't include the auto dissociation of water really at all. Uh, we just said, well, it's, it's 10 to the minus 7, but it's negligible relative to the change uh, in this case. So uh, we're not going to consider that 10 to the minus 7 uh, oh, this shouldn't be zero. This should be um, 10 to the minus 7 should be zero. This turn, this just becomes x then um, because 10 to the minus 7 is low. Uh, so then we substituted these x values in for the expression that we had and uh, 0.010 as the formal concentration in for ammonia. We solved that and we get a value of 4.2 times 10 to the minus. So let's just check our approximations really quickly. Right? So our first approximation was x was considerably lower than 0.01. So let's see how much lower x was than 0.01. Well, it was essentially 0.00042 molar. That's what x is equal to. Is that enough? Is that low enough? Well, we often just take the ratio and figure out what percentage uh, this value uh, constitutes here. So we'll say, um, the, the 4.2 times 10 to the minus 4 divided by the original value to see what percent change there was times 100%, that's going to give us a value of about 4.24%. So, okay, that's our first approximation. Is that good enough? I don't know. It depends, <laughs> as always. Uh, I'm not in the business of telling you exactly what is okay and what's not. I told you earlier that often the criteria we use in this class, if you need a criteria, often 1% is reasonable.
Uh, this is bordering on 5%, which is a pretty considerable change, meaning that's your error, right? There's considerable amount of error between uh, your, uh, based on simply your approximation. Um, so it depends on, on what you're going to use this data for and how many significant figures you have ultimately in the end. Um, if you're only maintaining three sig figs here, then uh, you probably wouldn't have seen it. Uh, but if you're main, if you're trying to maintain more, then you then it might have been uh, worthwhile. Let's, so that was the first approximation. Let's check the second approximation. Same way. So um, we'll take in this case 10 to the minus seven uh, divided by the 4.24 times 10 to the minus uh, four times 100 uh, percent. That's going to give us roughly 0.02 percent. Um, so the second approximation is probably pretty reasonable. Um, so the KB was small, but not so small that um, that the original concentration, the 10 to the minus 7, uh, rivaled what the concentration of hydroxide would have been uh, generated from simply the, the association of the NH3 and water. And so the second approximation is probably pretty reasonable and probably isn't going to manifest in too much error. Uh, but the first one certainly will. Uh, and for a lot of applications is not going to be reasonable. And so the punchline here is that I gave you sort of several waypoints by which you could have exited this, this uh, calculation with differing degrees of accuracy and differing degrees of error depending on what you need. Again, I'm not in this class going to ask you to spend an enormous amount of time doing uh, substitutional algebra. And since we don't know linear algebra yet in this class, or that's not requisite for the course, uh, then we're not going to use that as well, even though that's the really fast way. So um, what I want you to understand from or take away from systematic treatment of equilibrium in this discussion is that um, what you started with uh, whenever you took general chemistry um, sometimes works, but it sometimes doesn't. And if you want to get the exact answer, we need to con consider all of the equilibria at play, especially the equilibria that are going to contribute to some of those components that you want to compute, things like hydroxide. So virtually anytime you're doing a reaction in water, especially if it's low concentration of something, or it has a very low uh, Ka or Kb, then the auto dissociation of water, that reaction, becomes really relevant because that means the concentrations of protons and hydroxides from water itself start to be non-negligible. They start to be comparable to what is going to be generated from the reaction itself, in which case the error goes up if you, if you negate to include those in your equilibrium computations. We're going to keep talking about this, and we'll talk about this more once we get into acids and bases in the next chapters, 9 and 10. But this is the starting point for your mental framework and in, in, in thinking about how do you get the right answer every time, uh, and what are the successive levels of approximation depending on what you're de deeming acceptable. So just to finish this up uh, and segue into the next chapters, um, as I was discussing, when does systematic treatment of equilibrium become really relevant? And um, certainly when we have uh, acid-base systems where you um, are in the, the concentration range of 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8, uh, it becomes really, really important to consider the full treatment of equilibria, specifically meaning uh, the auto dissociation of, of water, auto protolysis of, of the solvent. So the, what, this, what this plot's showing you is that uh, either the blue line or the, the black line, those are additions of strong acids or strong bases to a, to a solution um, at, at their respective concentration. So as we get towards uh, smaller negative values, this is log concentration, that's high concentrations of those acids and bases. And so you can see the resulting pH on the y-axis. Uh, it makes sense on the black line, you've got HBr, strong acid, at really high concentrations in the 10 to the minus 2 range, uh, you have very low um, uh, pH, right? It's literally negative log of the concentration. Um, but as that concentration gets smaller and smaller and smaller, so we go to the 10 to the minus 3, minus 4, minus 6 uh, range, so you're in the micromolar to sub-micromolar range, um, you start to enter this blue region where I have written systematic treatment uh, is required here. Why is that? Well, remember that at, at equilibrium, water itself, the concentration of hydrogen ions uh, and hydroxide ions, if we're thinking about pure water, those are going to be equal 10 to the minus 7 molar. What happens in this range? 
it means that you have strong S's and strong bases that are fully dissociated into H+, plus, but the concentrations of those H+, plus are in the 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 8 range, which is coincidentally very similar to the range of hydrogen and ion concentration in pure water. So these things start to rival this. They're comparable. They're on the same order of magnitude. So that's when if you start to completely negate uh, the, the, the actual contribution of hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions from water, you end up with huge errors because it means that the concentration contributed from the strong acids and bases is actually comparable to or even less than that contributed from the weak acid base, which is water. Once you move to lower concentrations of these strong acids and bases, then those concentrations are in the 10 to the minus 9 uh, or even less range, so out here in 10 to the minus 10. In that case, the contribution from water is the dominant system, in which case the pH is essentially just 7, which is fixed by this 10 to the minus 7 range. And so it's this little window of two orders of magnitude when systematic treatment is necessary. This is going to be the starting point of the, the next chapter, so I just wanted um, you to, to feel good about that to start with.